happened to me is a number of years ago, there's a guy I was speaking to, and he's a well-known business person, and I asked him the question, and I said to him, what's the secret of your success? What's your secret? You know, if you see someone who you admire, it's good to ask them about what they do in their life. And the secret to greatness is not seen in just someone's peaks. It's seen in their daily routine. Amen? And so I asked this individual that question and I said, what's the secret to your success? And he said to me, simplicity. He said to me, Paul, it's simplicity. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, this is really cool. And I like the notion of simplicity. And then out here, a lot of great speakers, great teachers, also talking about simplicity. But how many of you know that you don't build your life, you don't build your life on what a motivational speaker says? Unless it's in line with the Word of God. You don't build your life based on what some successful guru says you must do, unless it's gospel. Amen? So I decided to do a little bit of research around this notion of simplicity to see is it central to the gospel? Is it central to the gospel? And I saw something very interesting. So would you please turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3. Are you expectant this morning? Amen. I'm sensing the power of God so strong. I believe He's going to do something. Even as I'm sharing these words, something is going to happen. I'm afraid the Bible speaks about the word of His power. Not just the power of His word. The word of His power. His power is encapsulated in His word. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? And that's what we want to do. Not nice people's ideas. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3. You can turn there in your Bibles. If you don't have your Bible with you, just find a Christian close by and share with them. Amen. <laughs> or you look at the screen. <laughs> Alright. But I'm afraid that, this is Paul speaking to the church of Corinth, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, that word crafty is the word in the Greek cleverness. I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds, that word mind, is the word your thoughts and your purpose. Your thoughts and your purpose will be led astray. I mean, feel that when your mind is led astray, it doesn't mean your mind just wanders. It doesn't mean your mind just drifts. That word there, led astray, is the same word for corrupted. It's like a virus. We've got lots of software gurus here. It's like a virus entering your computer. And so you end up not functioning properly. Do you know some people who are like that where their minds have been corrupted? Their minds cannot think properly. And that's what the enemy does. Well, well, where does that take us to? It says, and we'll be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. So central in our faith, central in our walk with Jesus is simplicity. Isn't that powerful? So I don't know about you, but if Paul the Apostle is saying to the church at Corinth, I'm really concerned that you guys will be led astray and you move away from simplicity. I don't know about you, but I want to figure out what's this simplicity thing. What is this simplicity thing? Amen. So here's an example of it. How did Paul manifest this in his life? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 2. He says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's simplicity, isn't it? And you see, what's happened is we try to be clever. Come on now, the average, the average IQ of people in this church is fairly high. We know that. I know there are people like Lucius who like, you know, boost it up a bit, you know, type of thing, okay? People like Sean Roberts, people like Trace and others. I have to mention everyone there because people think, pastor doesn't think I'm clever. But anyway, a number of you boost it up quite a bit for us, all right? But you see, you can be clever but humble. You know, Google has got that whole principle, that value that they've got, intellectual humility. You are clever, but you are humble. One of the marks of a genius, you know what it is? It's someone with childlike awe. If you study people who are geniuses, one of their common denominators is childlike awe. That sense of wonder. 
simplicity. And here, Paul the Apostle says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This is where you have conversations with people and they sound clever, but you can say to them, but where is Christ in that? That's where God is taking us. Where is Christ in that? Someone says, I'm a Christian. You say, where is Christ in your family? Where is Christ in your business? I didn't want to know anything else. I want to know where is Christ because that's where the blessing is. When God looks at you, he is not looking and saying, how well did you perform today or not perform? He is looking and saying, where's my son? Some people have this notion of when God is checking out all the churches that meet on a Sunday morning, he's wondering, okay, what are the hairstyles like? God doesn't focus on what we focus on. Yes. Come on now. Yes. He's just looking and he's saying, where's my son? Where's my son? Where's my son? Yes. That's the simplicity of the gospel we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. So God is calling us to keep the main thing, the main thing. But the natural tendency of us as human beings is to drift into complexity. That's why sometimes as a church we have to say, you know what? We're going to be minimalist about the meetings that we have next year. Minimalist literally means we don't have too many meetings that go overly complex. We just want to keep Christ central. That's why people ask me, Paul, what's the vision? What are we doing? And so on. And I pray about it and God keeps taking me to that space. And I was saying this to my wife the other day of making disciples who make disciples. Yeah. You can do all sorts of fancy things and trying to entertain people in church and so on, but Jesus is looking and saying, are you making disciples that are making disciples? Simple as that. No. However you do it is another story, but are we making disciples that are making disciples? No. Amen? Mm-hmm. The simplicity of the gospel. You see, every organization, if you, those of you study organizational behavior, how many of you study organizational behavior here? How organizations work and so on. I know there's some people in this church who put their hands up for everything. Okay. Yeah. But, okay, there are a couple of people. Okay, there are a couple of people who raised their hands. Okay. No, there are. None of you who raised your hands now do that. Okay. I was thinking there. But there's some people. Like, How many of you love training? Yes. How many of you love your wife? Yes. Okay. Anyway. But if you study organizations, organizations have a tendency toward complexity. Complexity. A natural tendency. If you look at your household, the natural tendency is towards clutter building up. We don't have to try hard in our home to end up having clutter building up. Come on now. You don't have to try hard. You don't have to work it like, I really want to clutter this house and fill it up with stuff. How many of you have moved houses recently? You know what I'm talking about. You're like, where's this come from? Where's it? How come this is it? Oh, I forgot all about that. And we get so emotional about our stuff. You know? And I want to just say to you, you have to be intentional about being simple. It's actually a choice you make. You make a choice that I know simplicity is an important value in my life and I'm going to keep things simple. The enemy's strategy is to make your life complex. Let me say that to the person next to you. The enemy's strategy against you is to make your life complex. By the way, if, you've got, if you're a nursing mom and you want to go to a nursing mother's room, it's a lovely room behind the video camera over there and it's got a wonderful, wonderful aircon. Some of you might want to just sit there even if you're not a nursing mom, okay? Because <laughs> it's so hot. So I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. My question to you is when you're discipling people, when you're interacting with people, do you want to know other stuff? Or is your interest, your primary interest, Christ and Christ crucified. When you interact with people, relatives, during this holiday period, is your interest in all sorts of stuff, or are you keeping the main thing, the main thing? Is this person in Christ or out of Christ? Because ladies and gentlemen, the common denominator, the great statistics, you know, some of you are into stats here, is that we're all going to die. And when we die, then comes the judgment. The ultimate judgment. I don't care how much cash you've got. I don't care how good looking you are. There are lots of good looking people in this church. It's also another thing that's quite. Some people skewed that. <laughs> but the point I'm making is there's a, there's, a, there's a statistic that's there that everyone is going to die. And people talk about that, but they don't talk about the fact that everyone will come to a place of eternal judgment. There's the two judgments. There's the white throne judgment. 
And the white throne judgment is where you either go to heaven or hell. And there's no Rhineland. I mean, if you studied history, there's no demonetized zone. They're just two kingdoms darkness, light. Yes. And then there's the judgment seat of Christ, where you're given crowns, where you're rewarded for what you did. Yes. Ultimate. Let's keep it simple. You see, question Jesus, was he very simple? Was he simple in his approach to things? Yes, he was. You see, simplicity is the mark of Christ-likeness, and simplicity is primarily a mental attitude. It's not just about trying to do simple things. You see, some people, when they hear a message like this, they try and just do simple things. Like, okay, let's cut this out of our lives, let's do this, let's do it. But their mindset isn't that. Some people think simplicity is just about not having nice things. No, it's not. You know, there's some people who don't have an awful lot of things, but they're not simple in their minds. I'm going to break down the definition just now. Look at Jesus. Look at his approach. Matthew 6, 25 to 27. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Remember Michael preached, um, used this verse recently. Do not worry about... He's not just saying, don't worry about exams, guys. I've got you there. He says, don't worry about your life. So, don't, what's not my life? <laughs> That's everything. Don't worry about anything. That's what he's saying. All right? What you will eat or drink. How many of you are worried right now about what you're going to eat or drink afterwards? Not that you won't have anything to eat or drink, but you're worried like, should I make it like this? Oh, what will they like? Oh. I know that's why sometimes we don't get invited to some of... I was going to speak bad grammar. Okay. But in some, people, some people's house was like, oh, no, dress. Yeah, I know. What did she eat? Oh, wow. I met someone recently, a lady from Uganda, they were in one of my workshops, and she was saying like, hey, Paul, I didn't know your wife was white, you know? So, I used, and that we were eating pub for lunch at the particular hotel, they so, I didn't know you eat food like this, what do you eat at home? You know, when, and she says, when I go to my clients' house, uh, homes that are non-people of color, okay, just like, you know, I, I make sure I eat before I go, you know? Then when I get there, I'm like, oh, no, I'm watching my don't worry. I'll just have salads, but I eat first. We eat normal food, guys. You know what? One of the enemy strategies that brings division, especially in a nation like this, is to exaggerate difference. Do you know that? To literally exaggerate difference. That oh, these people are strange. They must eat funny, strange stuff. And, oh, those people are. Ah, when they start ululating in church, oh, you know, the warriors have arrived. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> That's what the enemy does to create division. <laughs> no, seriously. I've I, I actually got a friend, and they came to our church one time, and there was one of the Zulu songs was playing and so on, and people were ululating. And the guy was honest with me. He says, Paul, you know what? When I think, hear those sounds, I'm thinking of 1918, <laughs> Are you not much more valuable than they? 
That's a powerful regulation to have that you are valuable. Okay? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? So Jesus here is saying worrying doesn't help. Period. Okay? Simple. Matthew 10, verse 19. It says, but when they arrest you, how many of you have been arrested before? Don't raise your hand. Okay? <laughs> He's talking about being arrested for the gospel. Right? Do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. How many of you trust Jesus that he gives you the words to speak? I go into certain coaching scenarios with senior executives, and I'll sound clever when I say what I've said. And after that, I literally take notes on myself. Some of my books had come out of that. I literally would have taken notes on what I would have said because it was straight from the Holy Spirit. He gives you what you have to say. Amen? Amen. All right. So what difference does your worry make? You see, what happens is, I teach people on visualization. I say, visualize, see it. Jesus visualized. He says, I do only what I see my father doing. The new ages have taken visualization to another level. But the biblical principle of using your imagination to see stuff before it happens is from the Bible. It's from the Bible. But they're acting like experts on it, but we have it here in Scripture. And everyone here in this room visualizes, you know that? It's just that most of us who worry, we visualize negative things. If you say to me, Paul, I'm really worried about what my boss thinks of me and what they're going to say. I can tell you right now, you're visualizing it. You are picturing your boss there blaming you, you know, that finger saying, it's your fault. <laughs> you're visualizing it. So when I come and I say, see yourself in that role. See yourself speaking with confidence. See yourself speaking and emotionally in charge. Emotional containment where you're not, you know, just loose emotionally and saying things out of control. See yourself powerful as a person. Visualize yourself doing that instead of the other stuff. Amen? That's very important. You see, worrying doesn't help you. So, when we talk about simplicity, if we look in scripture, what are we really meaning? What are we really meaning? We've established that Paul was into simplicity. Jesus articulated what simplicity actually looks like as opposed to complexity. It's a Greek Greek word that literally means single. That's the literal meaning of the word simple. It's single. You know when the Bible says being single-minded? It literally means lack of duplicity. You know some people who've got duplicity? The kind of people where they're double-minded. Where they come in and they say, I want to do this, I want to give, I want to pray for the sick. But there's another agenda. Simplicity is the opposite of that. It's being single as opposed to being folded. You know how you can tell how many of you used to apple pie people's beds? Do you guys call that? Don't they do that in South Africa? Okay, well, I was at boarding school and people would apple pie each other's beds. Yeah, it's where you take the person's sheet. Or sheet bed. Some of you call it a sheet bed. You take take someone's sheet and then you fold it. And then you put the duvet or the blanket over it. Then they come and try and sleep and it's like, oh, I'm stuck. Okay, my day's not. We used to call it apple pie in someone's bed. So someone who's not simple is someone who's folded, where there's double. Where you always have to see beneath the smile. Two-headed snakes, where you, they're good huggers. They hug you, so their hands are hugging you, embracing you. But there's a wink. You know how you know what I'm talking about? Okay? It's, so when we talk about being simple, we're talking about being singular. We're talking about someone who has a single focus and is not easily distracted. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about someone who's uncomplicated. They've got an uncomplicated life. What you see is what you get. They say what they mean and they mean what they say. Come on now. You know, some people, there's always a riddle. Like, but you say this last week, now this week you're saying this. That's not being simple. Okay? Simplicity speaks of clarity. People who are simple are clear. Okay? It's also, it's very interesting. Simplicity is the property, condition, or quality of being simple or uncombined. Uncombined. When you say I'm a Christian businessman, and it means I'm a Christian first who happens to do business. 
and Christ principles manifest in how I do business. It's clear. It's uncombined with something else. It's not an alloy. You guys studied alloys, right? Not an alloy where you mix the metals, right? Where they heat at different temperatures and all sorts of funny stuff happens. Okay? It's all it's interesting because it's the quality of being simple or uncombined, and it often denotes beauty, purity, or clarity. So simplicity is beautiful. And you know that sometimes some of the most beautiful artwork is simple and it's clear. And that word, when we're speaking of beauty and purity, it's the word kalos, which is honorable character, beautiful. It speaks of being unsuspecting. So someone is simple when they're not suspicious. That's how the Bible speaks of the simple minded. People just say, oh yeah, okay, we'll just say this to, to, to me as well. Oh, so he said it. I did it because he said it. I'm not thinking, hey, Baba, that's oh. That's the simple minded. How many simple people do we have here? Because society doesn't like simplicity. I mean, how many of you would say, you know what, Paul, I'm a simple person? Do you ever get invited to functions and people are like, what do you want? Do you want this? Are you okay? I've been invited for talks. And every few minutes, the person is okay. Oh, was your room okay? And they overly fussing over you, and sometimes you have to turn around and say, I'm a simple person. Come on now. The type of missionary that God is raising up today is someone who can spend the night at Buckingham Palace. Someone once said this to me, a billionaire. Once said this to me. Someone who can spend the night at Buckingham Palace in, in England, in London, England, at the same time can be spending the night in some slums. God has called us to be simple. And I don't care what car you drive. To just be a simple person. I like what Antoine de saint Zupery said. Excuse my French. My real French. Okay. I don't use that type French. Excuse this French. Okay. Do you guys know who do you know Antoine? Antoine de saint Zupery. How many of you watched The Little Prince? My family watched that day. He's the guy who wrote it. Le Petit Prince. Little Prince. He's the guy who originally wrote it. It was first published in 1932. Okay, let me something here. Right? I love what he says. He said, Perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. What's still left in your life? Your complicated life to take away. I remember I used to pray back in the day a certain prayer. Christ, may you burn me. Lord, may you burn me up so that only Christ remains. What's still left in you that still needs to be removed? Because it's clutter. I remember the other time the Lord challenged me because I was walking with a friend of mine. I've shared this story sometime back. It was years ago, about 1998. I was walking with a particular friend of mine and I remember feeling boosted that people were seeing me with this friend because this friend was already a pastor at that time. And our then pastor saw us together. I thought to myself, cool, you'll see us together and you'll see I'm also a spiritual guy. And the Lord challenged me and he said, Paul, when you became a Christian, you bore my name. You bore Christ's name. Why is it that you want to add other names to yourself? My question to you is, what are you adding to yourself that's not Christ? That's how the Bible tells us in the book of Colossians that in Christ we are complete. That's all I need. Christ is enough for me. Amen? I love, I love the way it says, perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. Has all the stuff been removed from you? What still needs to be taken away from your life? You see, simplicity is beautiful because it's honest. It's beautiful because it's honest. There's a guy called Richard Feynman. He said, you can always recognize truth by its beauty. How many of you know Richard Feynman? Those of you into software should know it. He was a, he was a, a theoretical physicist. Those of you into... Uh, particle theories and that kind of thing, complicated stuff. He's the guy who was at the forefront of nanotechnology. You guys know what nanotechnology is? Okay, if you want me to explain it to you, come to me afterwards, we'll have a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm just joking. 
Okay, but he pioneered that. He got, he got a Nobel Prize actually for physics in 1965. And there's actually, those of you interested in that kind of thing, there's actually a drama that was done by him in the late 90s, a Matthew Broderick film called Infinity, if you watch that. It was based on his life. Okay, but he says, you, now, so clever, so intelligent, but he says, you can always recognize truth by its beauty. Isn't that wonderful? Truth is beautiful. When asked why he did not smoke, Sir Isaac Newton replied, because I do not want to acquire any new necessities. <laughs> you see, some of us, we come to a place in our life where we've got things that used to be nice to have, but they're now must-haves. They've now become necessities. Come on now. Things that used to just be bonus nice to have. Come on, you see it with your kids. There's one of them running off. Okay. But you see it, we see it with our kids. Something that they used to really appreciate as a nice bonus, nice to have, now has become a necessity. And many of us have got all sorts of necessities in our lives, necessity in inverted commas, where we insist on having them, but they're not necessary. And so I call them necess unnecessary necessities. What has become an unnecessary necessity in your life? It started off as a nice to have, but now, it's a must have. You see, God takes us to a place of contentment where there's certain things we're able to let go of. There are people who are very big on, ooh, I must watch all my episodes of such and such a season. Ooh, season five has come out. And now they're telling me, I'm not mentioning names. Now they're telling me, Paul, you know what? One guy was telling me, yo, Paul, I don't watch TV anymore. In fact, I just, I just watch soccer. That's all I watch. Amen. Sean, so smart. Sean, Sean Roberts is smart. <laughs> anyway, what are those things that you feel like I can't do without it? Really? Really? You can't do without it? So I'm going to give you some steps to simplicity. Some steps to simplicity. The first thing to understand is that simplicity is unsuspecting. Simplicity is unsuspecting. You're not a suspicious person. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to 8. This is the love passage, isn't it? Love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy. Very powerful passage of scripture. But look what it says in verse 7. It always protects and it always trusts. You see, some people, everyone in their lives is considered guilty until they prove themselves innocent. Everyone who steps into their life to connect with them, they're thinking there must be a catch. But here the Bible says love always trusts. I'm not saying be gullible as a person, but I'm saying give people the benefit of the doubt. It's, much, it's a much better place and a better state to be in. And it says here love always trusts, love always hopes. In some translations it says love believes the best in people. Love looks for the best in people. If I see the treasure in my wife, guess what? I'll get what I appreciate. If I'm continuously appreciating the treasure in her, that's what I'll experience. But you know what? You can always find flaws in someone. And sometimes if you look hard enough, you find them. And that's the state you'll be in as you relate to them. So simplicity is unsuspecting. Number two, simplicity is being uncombined. Uncombined. It's where someone looks at you and they just see Christ. No mixture. It's where you say, Lord, we've come to glorify you and it's 100% his glory. Not those people where they say, Pastor, I really want to share testimony, I really want to share testimony. And they share the testimony, but you can see that the reason and the motivation and the drive for it. You know, I'm such an amazing person. Thanks. Thanks to the Lord. I'm really awesome, guys, and I just wanted to show you that I'm such a cool person. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> it's uncombined. Luke 16, verse 13 says, No servant can serve two masters. Jesus was simple. You can't serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. My question to you is, is Jesus your life or is he just a part of your life somewhere in some corner? 
See, the nature of biblical Christianity is it's exclusive. That's why when Jesus said, you can't be truly my disciple if you're trying to be my disciple, but you still want to bury your dad at home. I was about to say at crib. But some of you don't understand that language. Okay? It's exclusive. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Some translations say God and mammon, which is that demonic entity, principality that controls materialism in this world. You can't serve the two. You must decide. Matthew 6 verse 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Simplicity. God comes first. You know that when you've decided to follow Jesus and he's first in your life, decision making is so easy. It's so easy. The reason why decision making is often difficult in our lives is because of clash of values. It's because we are combined, we're not uncombined. I like what Albert Einstein said, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. <laughs> Jesus made the gospel simple for the simple-minded. Yes. And the people who end up benefiting the most from the gospel are the people who receive his kingdom like a child. Yes. The gospel is not complicated. And you see, sometimes when we're reaching the lost, when we're trying to get people saved, we complicate it. Yes. If you can't explain it to a six-year-old, then you don't understand it yourself. One of the gifts of teacher, how many of you are teachers here? Not just, not just teachers like in a school, but you gifted, you've got the gift of teacher. How many of you? Raise your hand. It's a gift from God. Don't be ashamed of it. If you keep your hand down, then you're rejecting Christ in your life. <laughs> Seriously. Come on. How many of you are teachers? Humility is agreement with the truth. So how many of you have been called as a teacher? Woo! Hands everywhere. One of the things about great teachers, they can take complex things and make them simple to understand. That's one of the gifts. There's some people, the moment they start speaking, you're even more confused. That's not a gift of teaching. If you're that kind of person, you don't have that gift. Okay? They say that if it's misty in your mind, let's say you're communicating something. If it's misty in your mind, it'll be foggy in the mind of the people listening to you. And there's some people, you know what I mean, they get up to speak and it's like you can see they haven't actually grasped the concept. Okay? Just be simple. The gospel is simple. The third thing is that simplicity embraces clarity. There's a great teacher, Howard Hendricks, a Christian teacher. And I like what he has to say. He says, the secret to concentration is elimination. You probably heard me share that quote before. The secret to concentration is elimination. If you want your children to concentrate on Jesus, then eliminate the fluff. If you're communicating something to people and you want them to grasp, don't waste words with all sorts of fluff. How many of you like to watch the special features after watching a movie? You know, you're kind of sad, oh, the movie's over. And your spouse might go upstairs and go to bed and so on. He's like, you're now curious about the actors and actresses. Who are they? Like, where's this coming from? How many of you like to watch the special features? Come on, there, there are always a few people, right? Thank you, thank you. I see that hand there. Pato, I see your hand there, right? <laughs> and what happens? There's a section, the deleted scenes. Yeah. Come on, we've got video people here. There's the deleted scenes. Yeah. Have, you, have you ever watched the deleted scenes and you think to yourself, why didn't they include this in the movie? It's so cool. Yeah. How many of you feel me on that? One. It's so cool. Why didn't they include it? I'll tell you why they didn't include it. For the most part, it was fluff. It wasn't adding to the storyline. You see, when you're a simple person, you keep the main thing the main thing. And so, my question to you this morning is what's the fluff in your life? What are the deleted scenes in your life? Where when you go to heaven at some point, and you're watching the video of your life, Jesus will then show you this should have been a deleted scene. This one, a deleted scene. It wasn't necessarily something that was bad that you were doing. 
but it distracted you from keeping the main thing the main thing what is that right now in your life the secret to concentration is elimination I don't know about you I, I turned 40 this year as many of you know and thank you for all the presents and I'm still receiving them for the rest of this month um, you know um, for those of you who <laughs> Who couldn't do it in September? Feel free. Now, I don't have a problem receiving. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. By the way, it's Smongle's birthday today. Smongle, she's in the nursing mother's room. It's her birthday today. And tomorrow, it's Vim's birthday. Wimbai's birthday. So please remember them. It's an opportunity for you to clap or cheer or something. Okay. But I was reflecting on my life quite a bit. And when you reflect on your life, those of you who've been 40, when you reflect on your life, you start thinking like... I can't waste time. Can't waste time. Can't waste time. No more deleted scenes. I must just stick to the main plot. Someone is getting it. What needs to be deleted in your life? What needs to be part of the deleted scenes section of your special features? Finally, I want to talk to you about some barriers to simplicity. What are the things that stop us from embracing simplicity? There's a guy called Ernest, Ernest Schumacher. You know, like the, not, not the racing car guy, okay? A different Schumacher, okay? A German guy. How many of you studied economics here? Okay, you should know Ernest Schumacher. Okay, he influenced a lot of thought in terms of economics. Okay, he's, I think he, one of his books was this Small and Beautiful. Okay, he was into decentralization um, technologies. Okay, he came up with awesome theories. If you look after World War II at some of the, the economics books that really influenced and shaped our thinking of economics. He's the guy who came up with it, right? And what is interesting was... He says something interesting. An intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. Isn't that powerful? An intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. It takes lots of courage, ladies and gentlemen, to be simple. Because sometimes you're sitting in a meeting and you want to, our natural tendency, if we're reasonably clever, is to want to show off our knowledge. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But there are times when the Lord will just say, you know what, keep it simple. Yeah. It's not about sounding clever. It's about the people getting what you have to say. Yeah. Wow. Amen. Some of the barriers to simplicity, number one, procrastination. If you're a perfectionist, you probably tend to procrastinate because you're waiting for the perfect time, perfect hour, perfect mood before you get started with something. And how many of you know that if you wait and wait and wait, the things you're supposed to do last month creep up onto you. The things you're supposed to do two months ago also creep up onto you. And one day you, you realize that I'm here standing in this moment with a million and one things to do. My life has become complex. Procrastination is a barrier when it comes to simplicity. Poor planning and scheduling. You see, if you don't plan your day, then someone else will plan it for you. So you'll be thinking, I really feel like doing X, Y, and Z. But someone else will come and say, this is what we've planned for you. Because the person who fails to plan is planning to fail. And the person who's a poor planner will always be at the mercy of the person who's a good planner. The unprepared person will always be at the mercy of the prepared person. Sure. Think about it. If you've planned your next few weeks and you know roughly and you've got a good idea of what you're going to be doing and how you're going to be spending your time in a way that glorifies God, when people come and try and distract you from that, you're able to say, no, I can't, sorry. But when you haven't got a plan, a general idea of what you want to do and what God has called you to prioritize, guess what happens? Everyone pulls you here and pulls you there. And some of those distractions are demonically inspired, ladies and gentlemen. Something people don't understand. They don't understand the work of the enemy to influence people to influence you. Not, not taking charge of your life. How many of you can safely say, Paul, I'm in charge of my life? You know, Jesus was not need-based. 
in his ministry. Jesus was mission minded in his ministry. That's why sometimes the disciples would come and they'll say, everyone needs you. Everyone is calling you. Everyone's calling you. You say, you know what? Let's cross over the lake because I need to preach to those guys on the other side too. And people don't like that. But if you want to be powerful, if you want to be effective in your influence in society as a leader, it's important to embrace the yes of your life. And you can only truly embrace the yes of your life if you say no to other things. And as we're going into this new year, many of us are already saying, yeah, I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to start doing this. My question to you is, where's your stop to do list? Of what you're going to stop doing? Because you can only start doing certain things if you stop doing other things. Poor delegation. I want to say this to moms in particular. Poor delegation. You know that there's so many things your kids can do for you? There's a, there's a whole principle. <laughs> I, I feel you, my brother. <laughs> there's a whole principle teaching your children to work. I'm not talking about child labor. But come on, when we were growing up, we did stuff. We were just boys. We were four boys, no girls. Right? We would do all sorts of things in the house and so on. I'm now a beneficiary in that department because I did my time back in the day. No, no, but I still do stuff. I still do stuff. The point is, we need to, we need to be able to delegate even to our kids. Yes. Otherwise, your life gets very, very complex. Poor use of the telephone. Do you let your phone master you? Or are you a master of your phone? Are you able to switch off your phone, ladies? And guys too, okay? Just to switch off your phone to say, you know what, we're now having family time, we're just chilling. If it's really urgent, they'll find a way to get hold of me. I, I promise you, the fact that we've got cell phones nowadays makes our lives very complex. Because you see, part of simplicity is singular focus. And there are times when God wants you to be fully present with your kids. Fully present and engaged with your spouse. And one of the reasons we get into hurry sickness and our lives get complex is we're doing multiple things at the same time. I know some people think multitasking is very good. But research has gone into multitasking. It's been shown that you actually perform better when you do one thing at a time. How many of you have seen that research? Okay. Yeah. Junk mail, newspaper addict, or TV addict. It's where you see yourself there, just going through the channel, just flicking, flicking. 30 minutes goes by, flicking, flicking. But we're not even aware of the time that has gone by. Oh, what are you doing? I'm just flicking through the channels. Back in the day when we only had two channels. <laughs> You would watch TV, you'd, you'd just watch whatever is there and it was fine and somehow you enjoyed it. Yeah. Now there are hundreds of channels and people are like, there's nothing to watch. Oh, there's nothing to watch. Yeah. As a society, we're not content as people anymore. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Lack of prioritization. How many of you work in jobs where everything is always busy and urgent? You're given work by your boss and you haven't got that skill set to actually say, okay, you're giving me this to do today, um, but yesterday you gave me that. Which one do you want me to focus on first? So you find yourself running around like a headless chicken because everything is piled up and you've got 50 different things to do and in your mind they're all urgent. You know when we were young growing up and we would watch, uh, we would listen to music and we had beatboxes, MIDI systems, what did you guys used to call them? Ghetto blasters, right? Wirelesses, no, Get, old type of wirelesses. <laughs> no, ghetto blasters, beatboxes, you know what I'm talking about, right? And they had graphic equalizers and there's some people, usually a particular people group, but I don't want to mention that, right? Who thought that if you put the volume up on everything, bass, treble, tenor and so on, then that's the best sound. We know that's not <laughs> correct, right? Yes. But there's some people who live their lives like that on a daily basis. For them, everything is on a hundred. Grandmother's kitten dies, crisis on a hundred. Oh, the, the milk in my tea, it was off, it was sour. Hundred, urgent, crisis. And they want everyone else to be stressed out. You know those people? They come to you and if you're just relaxed and calm, they're like, what's wrong with you? You must also be stressed with me. No. There's sometimes when we have to look and actually say, this is just a two. 
yes. on the gra- on my graphic equalizer the sky is not going to fall yes. and then this is now a 50 because it's fairly important and this is a 75 it's actually part of emotional intelligence being able to see that you know what this is important this is not important it's actually part of what i spoke about last week about a spirit of understanding that that discretion to actually say this is a priority this is not a priority it's a spirit of understanding and i'm telling you right now there's some of you here in this room where the enemy is distracting you with things that are not important If my eyes land on you when I'm preaching, I wasn't like trying to single you out. My eyes just sort of landed on you. Maybe it's your nice shirt or something, okay? So I'm like, oh, he was looking at me. I know he's meaning me because I shared that thing with him. Okay, it's not that. I know church people are sometimes very sensitive, okay? You see, it's possible to be active but not productive. There are a lot of people, they're so active, but they're not productive. And it's also pro- possible to be productive but not purposeful. So you're producing, but you're producing the wrong stuff. I could be here and I could take, I don't know, knitting needles. And let's say I was good at knitting, I could be knitting. I'm productive in knitting, but that's not my purpose right now. Some of you are very productive but in the wrong direction. There's only one direction, and that's Jesus. I know a lot of youngsters like one direction so I'm saying it's only one one real direction unhealthy relational dysfunctions have you noticed that when you are in an addictive relationship where you think you love the person but you just need the person whereas when you're in a complex relationship it's not simple you know those interactions with people where each time you're talking to them there's self-censorship You know what self-censorship is? You're always watching what you say. You always have to explain yourself afterwards. And you can actually be like that with your spouse. There are a lot of marriages that become like that, where you feel like you're treading on eggshells. Where you crack a joke, you know what I was really meaning with the joke? I wasn't meaning it that way and so on. That's very stressful. Part of being simple is you say what you mean and you mean what you say and you don't always have to explain yourself. So God is taking us to a place in our lives where we simplify our relationships. We simplify them. Where we simplify even our relationship with God. Where we simplify how we parent our children. Where we say, let's keep the main thing the main thing. One of the things I've learned is that the enemy strategy is to get us to focus on a lot of activities and to put aside what's really meaningful. The question I have for you this morning is the people you care about the most, what is it that they need from you that only you can give them? Give them that, the rest you can delegate. That's simplicity. Are you feeling me this morning? That's simplicity. The people you care about the most, what is it that they need from you that only you can give them? Give them that. The rest you can delegate. There's a lady, she's very senior in one of the banks. And people think that the more senior you are, then the less work rest balance you have. But she said to me, Paul, you know what? I'm a good cook. But between 4.30 and about 8 p.m., that's my time with my daughters. So I've delegated the cooking. Why? Because spending an hour in front of the stove every night is not the best use of my time. Paul, I'm spending my time doing homework with the kids and bonding with them. Simply because, and and she actually said to me, Paul, I can tell you all about World War II. I can tell you all about World War II. She's got teenage kids. For her, that was a choice she made to simplify her life. Now, obviously, to do that, you need support from your spouse and, you know, your whole system. But some of you traditionally are playing all sorts of roles at home that you don't actually have to play. And you might need to have conversations with, as a family to actually say, what's the best use of my time? See, people get so emotional about these things. A wife must always do this and this and this. A husband has to do, says who? Who says, show, show me the verse that says that. <laughs> No, I'm saying this because there are a lot of people who get very stressed out in their lives because they're doing all sorts of things and then afterwards they watch, they, they don't know their kids. Because they're so busy doing what a wife is supposed to do. So I know I'm a fast sprinter and everything, but so busy doing all sorts of things. 
but they didn't keep the main thing, the main thing. There's certain things that my wife needs from me as a husband that only I can give her. Yes. Emotionally. There's certain things that only I can give her. I must make sure that I'm giving her my best in those particular areas. And it's a challenge for us, isn't it? You see, many people today are very good at preparing to go to work, but they're not good at preparing to go home afterwards. I always say to people, I have to, when I'm getting onto the highway, going back home, I have to put my dad's cap on. I have to put my husband's cap on. If I go home and I'm now trying to lecture my family, lecture my wife or give her a motivational talk or whatever I would have been doing throughout the day, I'll get in trouble. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Many of us are so good at putting our best foot forward at work for our clients. We dress nicely, we talk nicely. But if we're honest with ourselves, the people we say we love the most, we're giving them our leftovers. Our leftovers emotionally, our leftovers intellectually. Someone is feeling me this morning. Keep the main thing the main thing. I like what Cloud and Townsend say about relationships. They say, when two people are free to disagree, they are free to love. When they are not free, they live in fear and love dies. One of the marks of great teams is unfiltered conflict around ideas. Are your relationships so simple that you're able to just speak freely? Have you noticed that the people you like the most are the people that get you and the people where you can be yourself with them? That simplifies relationship. But when you have to be a poser, you know what I mean by a poser? When you have to always put some kind of mask on, it's tiring because yes. then you feel anxious and the nature of that anxiety gap is the fear of being found out my neighbors will realize that I'm actually not as spiritual so I have to keep putting out up a front of my spirituality what if I get caught out what front do you put on what mask do you put on that is making your relationships more complex Sometimes God will take us on a journey where we fast from media, from trash. And then we realize after fasting from it for some time, we're more sensitive in our spirit, man. And then when you watch that thing that you used to watch all the time, after a while you're like, oh, I feel defiled this time. Why didn't you feel defiled three weeks ago when you were watching it? I'm going to close with four benefits of simplicity. Four benefits of simplicity. When you become someone who is simple, there's certain things that begin to happen. Are you getting something this morning? Remember all these things I'm sharing with you begin in the mind, hey? It starts off in the mind. There's a guy called, um, some of you might know, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Okay, those of you who read quite a bit. He said, life consists of what a man is thinking about all day. You're a summation of your thoughts very often, isn't it? What are you thinking? What are you worrying about? Is your life complex? Emerson, by the way, actually started out as a pastor. He used to be a pastor. Then he drifted a bit into pantheism and that kind of stuff. You know, where you see, believe that the divine is in everything and so on. Okay. But he's still one of the most quotable guys out there. But don't necessarily believe all the stuff that he's written. Okay. The first thing is to all our benefits of simplicity. People will trust you. People will trust you. John 1 verse 47. Do you remember Nathaniel? Nathaniel gets up and he says, can anything good come from Nazareth? That's what he says. And Jesus commends him. You see, Jesus perceives what's going on in the heart. You might have thought, Nathaniel is being rude, but Jesus actually commends him. He says, when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite to whom there's no deceit. Some translations say no guile. That actually speaks of simplicity. That's the kind of person where when they say something, they're meaning exactly what they say. And you trust them more because you know where you stand with them. Yeah. You see, some people, especially church folk, mm. how many of you know church folk? Yeah. They're Christians and then you have church folk. Uh, yes. With church folk, church folk come and they tell you what they think you want to hear. Yes. 
hey pastor and I don't know how, why they always have to put in an American accent when they say pastor <laughs> hey so how are you guys doing hey we're doing fine pastor <laughs> I remember one guy he came to me and he was a business person starting out and he was so enthusiastic not in this church in the previous church we, we, we passed it and he says hey pastor you know what I want to sow into the kingdom of God financially and I want to start right here in this church with what's going on here and we're so enthusiastic but God gave me per- perception seeing beneath the smile and I asked him out of the blue because he was almost like overcompensating I asked him out of the blue I said to him how's your marriage oh no pastor it's okay uh, you know what it's like sometimes you sort of you know things aren't always that easy and so on you know like my wife can sometimes irritate me but yeah we're okay what do you do to her when she irritates you oh no I get very angry if I was a, what do you do when you're angry with her and he tells me he's beating up his wife. Yeah. I'm talking about church folk. Yeah. With guile in them. Guile. Yeah. Deceit. Yeah. Deceit. And yet here some of you would have said Nathaniel is being arrogant, stuck up and rude. And yet Jesus commends him and says he is a true Israelite with no guile in him. I like it in the New Living Translation. It says, as they approached, Jesus said, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. Let me just say something. Being truthful is beautiful. And I'm not saying go to everyone and say, oh, I don't like your dress. Oh, I don't like your hairstyle. I'm not talking about that. Because the Bible says everything we say should come with grace and should be there to edify. But what I'm saying here is that when you're a person who is not always hiding stuff and not double-minded, your life becomes very simple. Because you're not going to say, oh, what did I tell that person? Then what did I tell that person? And I told this person this version. And there are multiple versions of the truth. Number two, the second benefit. God hears your prayers and protects you. If you study the technology of answered prayer, how God hears our prayer, because the fact of the matter is there's some people whose prayers are heard all the time and things happen. And there are other people where it doesn't happen. And people come and say, oh, no, no, but God loves all of us so he hears all our prayers and so on. But I see a lot of scripture that talks about where God's ears are shut off to certain people's prayers. And so I want to I understand how can I have more breakthrough and greater results in my prayer life? So God hears your prayers and protects you. Why? Because you're clear that God is my source. You see, when, it's a, when you're double-minded, God, I want you to protect me, but I also want to do my own thing, and this is what I really trust. I trust my own thing, but just in my religious life, I will just pray saying, can you protect me? That confuses heaven. It confuses heaven. Psalm 116 verse 6 says, the Lord protects those of childlike faith. Some translations say the simple. The Lord does what to the simple? He protects them. I was facing death and he saved me. Are you simple in that sense? Where it's like, God, you're my source of protection ultimately. In the English Standard Version it says, the Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. In James 1 verse 6 to 8. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea. Driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. So there's some people who shouldn't be expecting to receive anything from the Lord. Why? It says that he's unstable in all his ways. Why? Because he is double minded. He's not simple. He's folded. He's combined. He's the kind of guy in a prayer meeting you'll say, Lord, please give me such and such a breakthrough. But the confession of his mouth afterwards cancels out the prayer because he's saying the opposite thing. The third benefit is that you become wise. You become wise. If we're simple hearted, if we're simple minded, that becomes our source of wisdom. The Bible says in Psalms 119, verse 129 to 131, your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul observes them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to who? To the simple. I opened my mouth wide and panted, for I longed for your commandments. The simple. 
Psalm 19 verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. To who? The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. How many of you want to be wise? We have to be simple before God. I promise you some people have to be delivered from intellectual pride. Yeah. God resists the proud, the Bible says. He resists the proud. Number four, you feel fulfilled. You know, when you're simple as a person, you feel fulfilled. You see, fulfillment comes when you engage in meaningful activities. So why do we torture ourselves by doing unmeaningful tasks? How many of you have read the book, The Laws of Simplicity, by a guy called John Maida? He's a Japanese-American. How many of you know John Maida? Those of you in technology should know him. Don't feel bad, Emily, if you don't know him. But those of you in technology should know him. He's a guy who basically came, he's an artist, but then he also studied computer engineering. Okay, he's an MIT guy. And he's the guy who's really popularized, um, you know, those fancy things, you know, like on browsers and so on, and you have motion. I think they call it motion graphics and things like that. Things that we're so used to nowadays, he brought it in. And he's very big on the whole thing of business design and bringing art into technology and balancing complexity and simplicity. And he said something that I found so powerful. He said, simplicity is about subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful. Simplicity is about subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful. What is in your life that is obvious that everyone in Gauteng has? But it's not meaningful. Begin to subtract some of those things from your life and start adding the meaningful. The things that are truly meaningful. Begin to live by design, not by default. Don't be the default person who lives in Gauteng, where it's you and your household, us four and no more, and this is how we live. Subtract the obvious and add the meaningful. Amen? I want to end by giving you some reflection questions concerning simplicity and I'd encourage you to download the notes will be up on the website later on go church website but just download it and look through as a family and make certain decisions concerning simplicity because it will help you in your walk with the Lord number one what clutter do you have which is unnecessary you know that if things have not been used in your house in six months, you can get rid of them. Some people have those principles. Some people, after six months, they put it in their garage. And if they still haven't used it after another six months, they toss it, they give it away. Other people, if it hasn't been used in six months, it's gone. But you see, many of us become hoarders and our security is in what we have. And we're like, no, that's my little box. With what? You haven't used it in the last two years. And you've been okay, haven't you? You even forgot about it. In terms of stress, when you've got lots of clutter around you, it actually stresses you out. What high maintenance friendships do you have? Friendships where you have to actually face other people and say, listen, dude, I just want to be honest with you. You're right, I have been avoiding you. Because each time I interact with you, I feel drained afterwards. It has inter talking to you sucks the life out of me. It's affecting my relationship with Jesus. It's affecting my marriage. I'm just being honest. Because friendship is supposed to be mutual. And each time you talk to me, you want something from me. Some of you will be much happier people if you're able to have the difficult conversation. I've got a book coming out soon called Difficult Conversations, Crafting That Difficult Conversation. It's a problem a lot of Christians have, by the way. They don't have the difficult conversation. If you're a leader in any organization today, one of the things that takes you to your next level as a leader is being able to have the difficult conversation. Now that they did some research on marriages, there were a whole lot of marriages that were failing, that weren't doing well. Half the people ended up getting divorced, the other half stayed together. Do you know what the common denominator was amongst those who stayed together? They were able to have the difficult conversation. So what high maintenance friendships do you have? Where you need to say, let's take this friendship to the top. If this and this and this don't change, I think I need to spend less time with you. And that's why I always ask that question. Are you spending a few hours with people you should only be spending a few minutes with? What 
has lots of mind share. What do you worry about a lot? What consumes you? It will affect you and it will affect your health. What's really important to you? What's the essence of life for you? Is it your kids? Is it your spouse? Is it your purpose in God? How does that translate in your timetable? If it's not in your schedule, it means that it won't happen. Some people are like, I just like to flow, Paul. I just like to flow. Okay, I won't just flow. And then let's compare. I'm a researcher at heart. Let's compare where my life will be in five years and your life. Then we'll see what worked. It's like Cristiano Ronaldo when people are asking him, so are you the best in the world? Is it you or Messi? Are you the best in the world? He says, I don't need to say I'm the best in the world. The results speak for themselves. Just look at the stats. Okay, I like Messi just for the record, but I'm just saying. He said that and I thought, sure, that's really great. And then people said, are you, are you rivals? This rivalry between you and Messi. And he says, rivalry is to do with war. This is just a game. Keep the main thing the main thing. Okay. What can you undo in your schedule as opposed to just adding new stuff? Right now, in your schedule right now, what things can you undo? As we go into 2016 where you're saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. If you were to create a mental waste basket, what activities from last week would you place in it? If you were to create a mental waste basket, what activities from last week would you put into that waste basket? Because that stuff you did last week was a waste of time. Are there activities that you do on a regular basis that need to be reduced or tossed out? When was the last time you said no to an, in, an unimportant request? With some Christians, you literally have to sit them down and say, okay, say no. <laughs> no. Say it again, no. No. Because they struggle with that word. Yeah. Jesus said no quite a bit. What fears, if any, prevent you from saying no more often? Is it because you want to be liked by that family member? Have they become an idol in your life? What activities will you say no to this week? Look around. Are there any frivolous things or clutter that steal away valuable time for you? I'm saying all of these things because I want each person in this room to pursue their purpose in God. But just like Paul the Apostle said, I'm concerned, I'm afraid that the enemy through his trickery will get your mind away from the simplicity and the devotion to Christ. Do you spend hours cleaning, repairing, or praying for things that in your overall scheme of life are not that important? Sometimes we can spend a lot of time praying for things and God is just saying like, but that's not important. Why are you even praying about it? What things can you let go of? Viktor Frankl, who spent a long time in the concentration camps, the Nazi concentration camps, he said the last of human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. I want to leave you with that. The last of our human freedoms is to choose our own attitude in any circumstance. And something that we have to do here in Gauteng is to choose simplicity. It's a choice. Powerful people can do that. They choose. This is how I want to live. I'm removing the clutter. I'm removing the deleted scenes. And it's something we have to choose regularly because there's a war for our mind share. Can I hear an amen? amen. Let's pray.